They told me W. Bush is a really cool guy. They told me he's going to be a great laugh to be around. We're going to shoot some Paul, chop some wood on his ranch and hang out like a young John Wayne. And this was six months after he left office. So I was very lucky to get him because he's notoriously camera shy. Uh, as soon as the, the swing doors in his Dallas office opened uh, and he walked in, I realized this is going to be one of the most traumatic shoots I've ever had. He went right up to me uh, aggressively with two fingers pointing into my chest and he said, you better be photographing a guy who's happy and not some kind of snarler. Get it? Whoa. So what was happening? Now, uh, all I can do is give you my take. You see, I have uh, witnessed many heads of state uh, and government, as they leave office, they go through a very painful transition of power. Suddenly, there is time to reflect on their legacy, to get perspective on the decisions that were made when they had the seat of power. And I suspect he was going through a very difficult time himself. So what does he do? The last thing he wants is someone like me recording that painful process on film. So he wants me to show the mask of politics. In every picture, he insisted on this ridiculous, goofy smile. <laughs> and I thought I was failing as a storyteller and as a photographer because I, all I was getting was the, the lie. But sometimes the mask tells you more about the truth, actually, than the truth does. So, Tony Blair. I loved Tony Blair, and uh, this was also after he left office. And I said to him, you know, Tony, the day you were elected, I was a humble art student in England, facing a terrible recession and no opportunities of a proper career. And I cried tears of joy because I thought, finally, my generation have got a leader that is one of us. And this look comes over his face. And he says, well, that's all very nice. But did I live up to your expectations? To me, I've witnessed power very intimately, not intellectually, but from a human gut level. And it does definitely include one side, which is good leadership is power, uh, authority, charisma, capacity to make important decisions. But good leadership is also about something else, and that is service. And how can you be a strong, dynamic character and yet still regard yourself as a servant of the people? Sometimes there's a conflict there. And for me to learn about service, I didn't learn enough of that from the heads of state I'd worked with. I needed to go somewhere else. So I decided to do a big, large-scale photo essay once I was taken on by the New Yorker magazine. And it was called Service. And I wanted to photograph ordinary people, men and women who serve their country in America in the armed forces. Now, I did this work eight years ago. And I wanted in all earnest, to avoid all politics. I'd kind of had enough of it. And it was time to just focus on the humanity. So I'm going to show you some pictures. I got embedded with the US military um, for about nine months. This is graduation day at West Point Academy. It could have been something from 150 years ago. Uh, then basic training. This soldier, uh, it's his first day. So they shaved his hair off. They've given him new clothes and he's not got his boots fitted yet, so he's waiting in the corridor to have his boots. He's stripped of his old life, and look into his face. There's a sense of strength, courage, excitement about serving his country. He stands to attention in front of a civilian like me. So, there's not much to say about this, it kind of speaks for itself. But in the desert in California, the US military own about 100 square miles. And they have built Iraq and Afghanistan in that desert. And they simulate uh, towns in those uh, places uh, for their soldiers. And two weeks before deployment, all the US uh, military the soldiers uh, uh, go to this place. And it's called the Suck, because it's about as brutal experience as you can get as close to war. And uh, this was during that time. They have a street called Trauma Lane. And they employ hundreds of um, civilian uh, um, Iraqis uh, to uh, have a marketplace, to sell fruit, vegetables, to simulate a real town. And they, the, the soldiers are driven in in a platoon. And then they're ambushed. And uh, IEDs go off, rocket-propelled grenades. Um, 
this Humvee is blown up three times. And over here, you see a soldier coming out screaming, covered in fake blood from Hollywood makeup artists. And he's holding bits of his body, screaming in pain, saying, somebody help me. And they do this to desensitize the soldiers so that when they get used to seeing these things, when it happens for real, they're not rendered defenseless. This is uh, the guy who's a role-playing amputee. He's the one that was in the previous picture. And um, again, uh, it's Hollywood makeup. They put blood all over him to make it even more effective. His job is to shock. This is the Humvee, blown up three or four times a day. This is in California. And uh, this lady's an incredible lady. She, uh, she's the head recruiter. And she employs so many people from Iraq to, to work for the US government to help advise on cultural behavior, um, on how to treat people with dignity, so that when they go into people's houses, they know how to behave. Then I got involved with the Navy. Uh, uh, this is a uh, Seaman SS Limebury. And every day uh, on a ship, you are, they choose one of the sailors to uh, lower the flag at the end of the day to put the ship to sleep and then uh, raise the flag to wake uh, the ship up in the morning. And you can see the sort of sense of pride and dignity in his face because you know, it's his first day uh, uh, out at sea and uh, he's so proud to get the chance to do that. This is him and his friends. It's like uh, Anchors Away with Gene Kelly and Frank Sinatra. <laughs> now, this is uh, Maiden Voyage SS Antonio. And uh, this sailor, uh, he's never been out before. He's about to be deployed. He doesn't know how long he'll be away from home, and they don't tell him where he's going either. And you can see that sense of mystery of his future in his face. The families that are left behind, great sacrifice from the families. Uh, women with young children will, will probably have to bring up the children for at least uh, a year, uh, perhaps in some terrible cases a lot, lot longer. And women who are pregnant also know that they will give birth without their partner or their husband present. Saying goodbye to your boyfriend or girlfriend or your uh, you know, uh, wife, or, it's, it's very, very painful. This little boy, his daddy is in the Marines. Pretty much guess what he'll be doing when he grows up. I went to a Marine wedding. And it was a beautiful day, you know. There was this uh, so much pomp and circumstance and so much love and respect. And then after the ceremony, uh, I got an opportunity to photograph the bride. And she sat for me and all of a sudden this happened. And everything changed. And this face, this sadness in her face. And I said, what, you should be so happy. Congratulations. And she said, well, my new husband is being deployed tomorrow. And they tell me the chances are he'll be away for a year and a half. And hopefully he'll come back. So my wedding didn't really last very long, she said. So this is the point where everything started to turn for me on my journey. And I now started focusing on the return because at this point, it was all about mobilization, forward thinking, excitement to serve your country. So this is the return. I waited with this young girl for about five hours for her fiance to return from war. He's been away for maybe 12, 13 months. Now, um, these guys are like rock when they come home from war, uh, physically and mentally in some cases. And uh, he pulls up in the Humvee, drops his bag, and this young lady charges at him like a team of wild horses and nearly knocks this guy over with a force of love that I've never seen. In fact, I had to tilt the camera, you can see, because I wasn't expecting the composition to do that. The hug, the embrace. The first moment you embrace your loved one after so long. But look into his eyes. Something's changed. The idea of service has shifted. And there's pain now. There's sacrifice now. This picture was taken at um, the Army Hospital, Walter Reed. And it's divided in two halves. The top half is love, trust, loyalty, and compassion. The bottom half is pain, tragedy, and sacrifice. 
You see, she's his wife. And she looks at us and she's saying something very important. There's a transference of power right now. She's taking over. And she says with a protective arm around her man, I've got him home. And no one, no one will hurt my man ever again. And for the first time, he feels a sense of strength in her so that he can let go. I went to um, Arlington Cemetery and I photographed many bereaved families there who had lost sons and daughters in America's most recent wars. And one day, I saw a lady right across the end of the cemetery. And every day, she goes to her son's grave who died fighting in Iraq. And she brings a little fold-out picnic chair and uh, she sits down and reads a book to his spirit. I was so moved by this beautiful um, expression of dealing with loss in a very dignified way. And so I went over to her and I explained what I was doing and asked if she would sit for me and she graciously agreed. She took the book she was reading and she placed it at the bottom of the gravestone. And she got behind the gravestone and cuddled it as if she's hugging her son. Now I was so aware of our body language and the sensitivity of the moment that I didn't even notice that the book she was reading is the Quran. And I didn't even read what was on the headstone because I was focused on her mannerisms and I was just devastated by the fact that she closed her eyes for me. So it wasn't until I got back to the New Yorker and I was editing and I saw that uh, there were these other elements added to the picture and it was an interesting story. We published this picture along with 20 other pictures in the magazine um, as part of this large-scale photo essay. And we published it three weeks before Obama, uh, his first election with John McCain. A week later, I was watching the news on a program in America called Meet the Press. And there's a very famous news anchor called Tom Brokaw, who was the host. And he invited Colin Powell, General Colin Powell, to go on the news. There was an important statement to be made. So I was sitting watching with my wife, and General Colin Powell said, um, I have an important announcement to make. I can no longer endorse my fellow Republican, John McCain. I am switching sides to support, support Barack Obama. Tom Brokaw, the news journalist, said, um, well, with great respect, General, uh, this is massive news. This is devastating news to the Republican Party, and it's only 16 days before the election day. We're not even sure um, John McCain can recover from this, because with you comes large parts of the military support and the Pentagon, <laughs> as well as many moderate Republicans will just follow you in support. What on earth made you change your mind? A photograph changed my mind, said um, the general. And he went on to describe this picture. He said, let me be clear. John McCain is a good man. He's a friend of mine, and he's about as non-discriminatory as any man could be. But I am disturbed by what I hear about the rhetoric in the Republican Party. He said, I hear at the back of the room sometimes in meetings, Obama is a Muslim, Obama is a Muslim, and he might be associated with terrorists. He said, first, he's not a Muslim, he's a Christian. But the real answer is, what if he was a Muslim? What is wrong with being a Muslim in America? We are supposed to be a country united by our differences. We are supposed to be a country that celebrates the fact that we think and feel differently about things and we are supposed to be all free together. He said, I saw a photograph of an American Muslim and she gave the greatest sacrifice to a country you could ever ask anybody to give, her son's life. He said, I would be very proud to stand by her side as a fellow American. And even though I fundamentally disagree with Obama's economic policies, I hope as a human being he will represent a more inclusive society. So I always put that above economic policies. So this picture was then voted the most powerful picture of the entire election. And it wasn't of Obama, who I had worked with many times, and it wasn't of John McCain, who I'd also worked with, or anyone powerful or famous, or, you know, it wasn't anyone like that. It was a picture of the most ordinary lady 
dealing with something that we all have to deal with. The one thing that perhaps unites us all. And that is that we all get to love and we all lose. So, this is Jessica Gray. She holds the flag they draped over her husband's coffin. She has um, a chain, his wedding ring on a chain. He was killed in Iraq a few months before I took this picture and she had a three-year-old daughter. Now, when you're killed in battle, they send your belongings back to your loved ones in a metal box. So she had not yet had the courage to open the box. I was in her house and I suggested that maybe she should wear an article of his clothing as a tribute to him in the picture. So she said, well, I'd love to wear his army t-shirt, but it's in the box. So now in front of me, a complete stranger, it was time to open the box. I knelt by the box with her and we both undid one latch each and as we lifted the lid she cried and I suddenly felt ashamed because here I am as a photographer almost being predatorial and taking advantage of a situation for the sake of a picture and I knew this is one of those moments where I did cross the line and I apologized to her and I said please Jessica you've been hurt enough and this was the worst idea I ever had. I don't want to put you through any more pain. It's only a photograph. Let's leave this idea. And she says, you don't understand why I cry. She says, I'm crying because I just realized they washed his clothes and I wanted to smell him again. This is what it is, my friends, to be alive. These are the sensory perceptions that we all have as human beings, no matter who we are. And if I can dare to set you a homework assignment, it's that you wake up tomorrow with a clear head. And if there's anyone in your life that you respect, love or admire, tell them, because you still have a chance. So I end with this picture. Eight years later, as Obama prepares for the moment where he reflects on his legacy, just like W. Bush did, just like Tony Blair did. And it slightly worries me that after eight years of progress, in quotes, the rhetoric is still there. And unfortunately, this whole photo essay that I did that should be well out of date now is troublingly relevant. So thank you for listening.